Um, I'm your host, Nick Kilmetha, and with me is Kevin McNellis. Kevin, great to have you. It's awesome to be here, man. And, and like you said, great to see you face to face. Yeah, yeah, it's exciting, you know, to kind of get back into, um, you know, draft podcasting. I think that, you know, as the as the season goes on, you get a little bit tired of hopping on a podcast and talking about the same things. But draft is just filled with so much variety, so much excitement that, um, you know, it's it's always a fun topic. Uh, you know, round one is going to start this evening or, you know, this evening as, as you're listening to this podcast. And, you know, I think the Ravens are in a really unique position. Uh, you know, they have just five picks, something that's talked about a lot, you know, compared to they came in the draft with, what, 10 last year and, and, and picked up another pick during the draft, made 11 picks. So they have half of that this year, which is just, I know, a position this front office doesn't love. Um, so what are you looking for? You know, supposing we'll talk about trades back later, um, but, you know, supposing the Ravens stay at 22, what are you looking for in that first round player? You know, what are you looking to get out of them, you know, as a talent? And what do you kind of want want to get out of them in their first four years? I mean, ideally, and, uh, you know, this probably goes without saying, this is hopefully somebody that you plug in and you see them immediately in camp when they're paired up with the ones going, this is a guy we're going to be able to plug into the starting lineup right away. Um you know, you look at the philosophy, obviously, of best player available that's there. We've seen that from the Ravens in a few different positions. But I think, you know, you amalgamate that idea of addressing a need and best player available. Right now, the Ravens do have a couple of high profile needs, wide receiver, uh, corner, inside offensive line, minute guard. I mean, you know, I don't know that that's one you spend a first round pick on, but you look and you go, okay, you know, what are our greatest areas of need? How do we weigh that? And then what do we do to address it? Because I think that there are some guys, you can hit some home run picks here in the first round. Yeah, I think the Ravens, are kind of, it's interesting you bring up that that best player available strategy, because I think it's something that is talked about. The Ravens, it's thrown a lot around is like, oh, they only go with the best player available. Um, you know, they ignore positional value. I think that's true and not true. You know, I think, you know, they, they went after Hollywood and Bateman in the first round in, in 2019 and 2021. They've drafted receivers. They're always drafting corners. Um, you know, I think that they have a, a pretty good balance, I would say, in terms of saying, okay, here's the best player we have on our board, but here's where, you know, they, I think they kind of incorporate the positional value and need into their rankings instead of looking at it as a separate thing, which I think is a, a smart thing to do. Um, you know, it felt like last year they were just going best player available at every single pick. Uh, I think that's a little bit of a shift in their strategy in the previous years where it felt like they were going with best best need available is what I kind of term it, um, you know, drafting Hollywood Brown, OA. Bateman, uh, Patrick Queen, those are all high profile needs that like the ones you're talking about that, you know, the team chose, you know, the best player at one of their top positions of need. And I don't think that's a bad strategy is thinking about need. I think, um, you know, I think that that is perfectly fair, especially for a team that, like you're saying, you want that guy to come in and start um, year one, a team that, you know, is competing for the Super Bowl. They can't afford a first round pick to not be an important player on that team. So, yeah, I, I definitely agree. You're, you're one starter. And I think 22 is an interesting spot. 14, I wrote a ton last year about how interesting of a position the Ravens were in with 14. 22, um, and it should be 23, if not for the Dolphins sacrifice in their first round pick. That's a spot they've been in a lot in the past five to 10 years where they're picking at 22 or 23, or they are traded or they've traded back there from the teens um, and are there. And, and a lot of times they'll trade back from that spot. Um, other times they'll select a player. This year, it just it feels like they want more picks. It feels like they're leaning towards a trade back unless they have a guy fall to them who they love. And I think that's where I want to start today. Who are some players that you think could, could kind of fall, maybe some top 15, top 20 consensus guys who could fall to 22 for the Ravens? In my dream scenario, that would be Jackson Smith and Jigba. But I think, you know, you're talking about consensus number one wide receiver and as big as that position is league wide. Like, I don't think that happens. I think the odds of that happening are astronomically low. Um, I mean, you think maybe if a team like really falls in love with some of these like high profile playmaking tight ends, and they want to make those their first round selections. At that point, maybe you're talking about like one of these premier offensive tackles that might slide down the board a little bit. Um, a guy like Paris Johnson, who can play multiple positions across the offensive line. Like I'm, I, I don't think, I think if they selected him, it would still kind of leave a sour taste in my mouth if they picked him at 22, but by the same token, like you pick a guy like that. And again, I mean, you're sure that is an immediate starter, a guy that you can plug anywhere on the offensive line, um, and know that he's going to be a starter from day one. Um, again, dream scenario, maybe a guy like Christian Gonzalez or, or, or Devon Witherspoon. But again, I don't think that you see those guys there. I think with, the premier corners that you have at the top end of this draft, I think they're long gone by the time 22 rolls around. Um, so you're probably talking about offensive tackle, maybe edge. Um, 
a guy like Nolan Smith, if they really love him, maybe they give him a look there. Um, but again, I, I just don't see that the need is that high. And I know that they have a couple of young edge players that they'd like to develop um, coming into this year. So um, I, I think if you're going to see one where it's, they're going to give him a hard look and maybe consider it, I think it would probably be an O lineman. Yeah, I think, you know, you can, I think, you know, get, getting premium offensive tackles outside of the first round is always so hard. And as much as I think this team likes Daniel Falele and sees his potential, um, you never have enough depth there. McCarry right now is, you know, could be in the spot for a guard, could be in the mix to compete for that guard spot, is the only other guy on the roster who can snap a football other than Tyler Linderbaum. And all of a sudden, Falele is your swing tackle. And so that's not a great position to be in either for a guy who look, he looked fantastic stepping in at left tackle. Can't say enough about him and how much I think he'll contribute on the next level. But uh, you know, Moses is Moses is older. He's not around forever. Uh, Stanley is not old, but he is aging and has a significant injury history. And so I don't think you can ever be really that solid at tackle. So I wouldn't hate that, especially if it's a guy like Johnson, who, who really is a top 15 player, in my opinion, and falls all the way there. Nolan Smith is the guy I have my eye on to fall. He, he's he's 236 pounds, I think is what he last weighed in at. And no edge defender under 250 pounds has been drafted in the first round since Leonard Floyd and Darren Lee in 2016. And, and and, and, you know, only one of those guys really turned out to be a first round caliber player, you, you could argue in, in Leonard Floyd. And so I could see teams being worried about about his size and dropping and, and you know, going with Lucas Van Ness, uh, one of the bigger edge rushers in this class, Miles Murphy, these guys that have inside outside versatility that might be more valued. Smith is about as pure an edge as it comes. I'm not moving him in. I'm not moving him in at all. Like Will Anderson can move in, play four tech, do whatever. Smith is staying out there um, and he, he's fantastic. I love his attitude. I love so much about him that I, I still have him as a top 15 talent because of his position, his ability to just, you put him out there on the edge. He's going to get to the quarterback. He's, he, he's small. I get it, but man, is he feisty and he's got the play strength to match. Um, I love his attitude. All the interviews I've seen of him, everything I've read about, you know, his approach to the game is fantastic. So that's what I'm keeping my eye on to fall a little bit. Um, I think the other guy who I think, you know, he he's bounced back and forth but just still feels like a top 15 player is, is Joey Porter jr. Um, you know, I think that one of the comps, I think it's the ringer is the comp is if Joey Porter jr. Had a son who played quarterback, which is exactly how he plays quarterback. He plays it with that level of tenacity. And I, I think he should be another top 15 pick. And that's why Deontay banks just feels like he's the more likely option for the Ravens at cornerback at 22. But Porter is another one that could fall and say, well, you see that big of a difference between him and Christian Gonzalez and Devin Witherspoon, those tier one guys you mentioned earlier. If teams see a real chasm and in, indifference between them, they may be willing to let Joey Porter Jr. slip and, and address cornerback later in what is a really, really strong cornerback class. Um, so I, I, I like both of those picks, and I, I, I like all three of those picks. I mean, offensive tackle is, I think, a sneaky one that, you know, there's you, it, it is hard to find cost-efficient players at, those valuable positions. And so if you can get them in the draft by any means, edge, cornerback, wide receiver, offensive tackle, you, you can't argue with the value. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't, I, I think I agree with you that I don't think everyone would be as happy with, with an offensive tackle pick. Um, but if it's a guy like Johnson, that's, that's talent you can't ignore. And the Ravens aren't going to let that go by. They didn't with Kyle Hamilton last year, even though safety wasn't a need. And I think this would be, that would be a similar situation. Um, Moving on to kind of our, our roundtable picks that we went through uh, this the past few weeks, which has been really exciting to see everyone's different takes on who the Ravens should go with. Um, I guess let's start with receiver. That seems to be the really popular one. What are you looking for in a round one receiver generally? And then talk to me about your pick. So I think so much of that answer could change within the next 24 hours from now, depending, you know, there's obviously been whispers about, you know, DeAndre Hopkins or whatever. So you know, if, if you end up getting him in the fold, I think at this point, what you're looking for is somebody who can study behind two veteran wide receivers and then play as a compliment to Rashad Bateman. Um, a guy, honestly, that I've loved in, in watching what he can do in an offense as mostly what you're seeing as a slot receiver, but a guy that you can deploy anywhere is Zay Flowers. And the reason I say that is his route running is unbelievable. Um, you know, you talked about size earlier, obviously not an oversized wide receiver, but he runs every route like he is trying to embarrass the defensive back that he's against. And he does it frequently. Mm -hmm. um, I love what I've seen from Jordan Addison as well. Um, he's, he's a guy that like, he plays the game so nasty, but he plays it nasty in a good way. 
Um, he plays like he's not going to shy away from contact. He's going to go up and try to, you know, take the ball away if it's a contested catch. So realistically, what I'm looking for is a guy that's going to compete around the boundary. And then if it is a situation where you have to work with route running rather than size, somebody like Zay Flowers would be a perfect fit. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, there's, there's very clear top four receivers in this class. Some people would put um, one of the Tennessee guys might sneak into the first round, which I could absolutely see. I think they're both fantastic, but clearly the top four is um, JSN who we've, we've talked about just, just fantastic. No way he, he falls to us. Um, I think that's, that is, that is a, a dream within a dream within a dream. Um, but beyond that, Addison flowers and TCU's Quentin Johnston all seem like they'll be available at 23. I think it's funny that we all shied away from Quentin Johnston in our picks because I think everyone sees him and sees a little bit of Brashad Perriman, the injury history, um, you know, big guy, less competition, good production, but you're not really sure how he's going to match, how he's going to duplicate that in the pros. And I completely agree. Um, you know, Flowers is, I think it's interesting, you mentioned Hopkins. I think without Hopkins, you there's a real case to be made for Addison. He's an outside guy who can play in the slot, but definitely is um, capable of playing on the outside and is a lot bigger than he weighs in at and measures at, at the catch point. He plays big, like you're saying. And it's, it's like six feet, I think 185 ish. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's a pretty thin frame, but I still think that he is the route running chops and, you know, that mentality that you talked about to, to go up and get balls. But if you bring flowers in the fold, then you're thinking, or I'm sorry, Deandre Hopkins in the fold, then you're thinking, okay, well I've got Hopkins locking down the outside. Bateman and OBJ can both be in the outside in the slot. Let me get a weapon. Let me get let me get the guy who who I can dial up plays for, who I can get into space. Um, and I think that's Zay Flowers. So I really like that look. Um, moving on to cornerback, which just, you know, after the Odell signing really feels like the direction they'll go if they don't trade back or have a guy fall to them. You know, our panel went with Deontay Banks and Joey Porter Jr. is expected. I already talked a little bit um, about Porter, just classic press man guy. Um I think he's actually a better athlete than he gets credit for. Uh, and I, I definitely think he plays like a Raven. He's got that edge to him. Um, but I, I think it's more likely, like I was saying, that he's gone. So so tell me what you think about Deontay Banks, who kind of just seems to be the safe stock pick for the Ravens at 22 right now. I I love Deontay, um, you know, and obviously not just with the hometown bias of him being <laughs> a Maryland guy. Um, I got the opportunity to go to the Ohio State Maryland game this past season. And so obviously playing against high profile competition at the time, I think they were the number two team in the country and to see the impact that he had in that game, not just on what showed up in the box score, um, but he had a play over near the sideline where he came like this close to bringing in a, an interception that was like down near his shoelaces, blocked a kick. He was everywhere. And, and he's a player that even if you didn't know what a high profile impact player he was on that defense, if you're watching it fresh, you're like, who is this kid? And the comparisons that he's gotten to Marlon Humphrey, like imagine having two Marlon Humphreys in your defensive secondary. Like that would be, I, I don't envy a quarterback having to try to pass against the secondary that they would put together if they bring in Deontay Banks, because he is so versatile. And I mean, at that point you've blanketed the entire defensive secondary. There's really nothing you can do. Um, so, I mean, I, yeah, no, I definitely would be excited if he came into town. That's for sure. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of his. I think he's just, he's just so smooth in, in his movements. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't necessarily see like that high end, like sauce Gardner level potential, but you're never going to get that at the end of round one. Um, getting someone who profiles like Marlon Humphrey and, and has that potential is, is immense at the end of in, at, the, at the 22nd overall pick. And I think the thing I like with banks is even though he's like, he was fairly unheralded as a name in college, um, how quickly he rose in the draft rankings after people really started to study his film and study his game, I think really shows like, wow, this guy pops. Um, and that's, I watched the Ohio State game a couple times because um, I was watching him and Ja'Cory and Bennett. And it's one of the games where you can tell the difference between them. You can tell who's ready to come in and defend NFL caliber receivers day one and who has the tools, which Bennett does to do so, but still needs a lot of refinement in his game. Um, the other thing I think is interesting about Banks is he's big. Um, he's, he's tall and long, but I think he's so fluid that I still think he could play in the slot if needed. I don't think it's where I'd put him right away. Same thing with Marlon Humphrey. I don't like, I don't want to put him there, but you know, say we draft Deontay Banks and um, you know, we don't find a way to get Marcus Peters or Rocky Asin in, and we have to go with Brandon Stevens as cornerback too. I personally am more comfortable with Stevens on the outside than I am with him in the slot. And you just slide Banks or Humphrey in the slot. You can do that based on matchups. You've got Kyle Hamilton. I think it creates a lot of interesting opportunities for Mike McDonald and his defense. For sure.
Um, moving on to offensive line, uh, you know, we talked about this a little bit. The, the need is at guard. They don't have a starting left guard right now. Um, ben Cleveland, John Simpson, and potentially Patrick McCurry are going to be competing for that role. I'm not in love with the prospect of any of the three of those, right? I think we could definitely see the Ravens, you know, looking for a guard on the market or something like that. But, um, you know, the, the, the other thing is, you know, they definitely will not go center here. They, they, there's no chance they go with the center here. Um, I think that's a day three thing to think about for a backup for Linderbaum. But like you said, they could go tackle here with the best player available. Um, so, so let me know who, who's your ideal offensive lineman to take here. Um, you know, you talked about Paris Johnson initially, but maybe another option who you would go with in the first round. So I know the, the big sexy name for an interior offensive lineman in the first round, round has been Osiris Torrance. I'm not sold on him simply because of the athleticism and the profile that I've seen. Um, I mean, maybe you look at a guy like Broderick Jones and see if you can keep him there or if maybe you move somebody around. Um, just see what the, you know, what the profile looks like um, because he's, he's a guy that he's just so nasty. Every single rep, you see him just bullying guys that are, are trying to rush the passer. So um I don't, I mean, off the top of my head, I don't know how much he's played on the interior. Um, again, I mean, I think probably we've, we've talked about the guy that I would prefer if we really had to go all line at 22. Um, but yeah, I, I think I'm more impressed with these tackles that may be able to transition to guard than I am with the idea of taking like a pure interior offensive lineman at the first round. Yeah. C Cyrus is tough. Um, you know, I think I, I was, when I was kind of initially looking at his profile and then watch, watching some film, I, I kind of got the feeling he has somewhat of a similar profile to Kenyon Green last year, except the thing with Green is he played a lot of right tackle. And, and Green, you could – Green played left guard, right guard, and right tackle, I believe, a lot. And so, you know, you can be really comfortable putting him at any spot, whereas Torrance only played right guard. He had 46 snaps at right tackle in 2021 and, and is not a guy you'd ever put at right tackle because of those movement skills you're talking about. And so, to me, it's – you trade back to the end. You don't like what you see at 22. You trade back to the end at first and you grab a plug and play guard and, and, and try and take it. And I'm happy to take him at the, at the end of the first round because you get that fifth year option because the fifth year option is starting to become less efficient for players who hit pro bowls early on. But like you're saying, I'm not sure Torrance hits a pro bowl um, in the first four years of his career, in which case that, that fifth year option is actually going to look pretty affordable um, if, if he turns out to be a, you know, well above average starting guard in the NFL, that that is still a very valuable thing, um, especially if you lock it down at, at a at a relatively cheap rate early on. So, um, I th I think that's who I'd go with. But but at the end of the round, I I would not feel very good about that at twenty two. Mm -hmm. Defensive line is interesting to me in the first round. We talked about Nolan Smith potentially falling, and that is one of kind of the ought to be one of the areas of need for the Ravens. I think it's because people aren't necessarily sold on Odafe Owe as, you know, that guy at edge, that real impact edge rusher. Um, I, I think people are forgetting a little bit about David Ojaba, which makes perfect sense, you know, coming off the injury, going to have to catch up pretty quickly. Um, but Tox Bowser came back last year and looked exactly as I was expecting, which is fantastic. Um, so I'm not sure I'm, I'm sold on an edge at 22 either. Uh, interior defensive line, the concern would be the talent level at interior defensive line at that point in the draft. You're likely, you're not likely to see, um, obviously, Jalen Carter is not going to be making it all the way down there. Um, maybe, maybe you get a chance and see, and I, I always mispronounce his name, um, maybe you get a chance to see Kalijah Kansi. Um, and I think, you know, that could be an interesting thing for the Ravens to look at. Um, but what are you thinking for? What are you looking for in a defensive lineman in the first round for the Ravens this year? I think if you, well, first of all, I mean, and obviously you kind of talked about it. There are guys that you see projected in the first round that have the ability to play both inside and outside. Um, Kalijah Kansi is one of those guys that just based on physical skill, you can kind of slide anywhere. Um, and you kind of, you know, you said it yourself with the combination of OA, who admittedly, I think, underperformed expectation a little bit last year, mm -hmm. um, being able to pair him with a full offseason working with David Ajabo. You have these two young guys that are used to, you know, working with with this defensive staff now. Um, I think at that point, maybe, you know, you look at a guy that could become another rotational piece. You look for, you know, another really quick guy off the edge. And so if you don't land a guy like an Olin Smith, you know, maybe a Kalijah Kansi does end up getting a look. Like you said, Jalen Carter, you know, if, if he ends up falling, like it would only be because of, you know, an, an amplification of all of the off field stuff that's been going on with him. Um, but in I, which I, case, I, I, well, in which case the Ravens certainly wouldn't touch him either. Right. I think if it's bad enough that you see him slide out of that top 10 projection, like I, yeah. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know that there's any guy that fits the profile enough where I'm like, yes, I love them at the end of the first round. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what you're talking about is if you have the draft capital somehow by trading back, there's a crop of guys that are in there that are really good. Um, maybe, maybe BJ Ojulari. Um, if I really love the way that he profiles, I think he's more of a second round top, you know, top part of the second round guy. Uh, his ball skills have been really impressive and he can drop back into coverage just based on his profile. But again, like I, yeah, I mean, outside of Nolan Smith, I don't know that I love any of these guys. Yeah, no, I agree. I think Smith is kind of a no brainer just for value alone at 22, but this, this kind of, this crop that is really polarizing and people don't really know exactly what to do with these, these guys who are two, you know, two, six, five, two seventy, all three of them, actually miles Murphy, Lucas Van Ness and Tyree Wilson, are they're all about there and they're all kind of towing that line between tweener and versatile because, you know, they all have, you know, excellent physical skills in different ways that, that can be used inside and outside, but how effective will they be at translating that into the NFL right away and being able to play multiple roles? Um, you know, I think McDonald would really have to see a role for one of them in his defense and really have to, you know, separate how they can, how they, how they were effective in college from how they can be effective in the pros. And I think that's the tough thing with these versatile prospects is, you know, they might be really effective edge rushers in college that can flip inside and rush the passer in college, but you're not going to see both of those things show up in the pros. Or you might have to really choose and say you got to define, you got to develop your skill set and your body type towards one of those things, not all of them. Um, and so I think that's the tough part with this this crop of, of first round defensive linemen. Um, you know, Brian Brucey is is a guy who's mentioned a lot. I think as a as a late first rounder, um, gosh, that's another one I'd want to trade back for because it just doesn't feel like he is bringing a ton other than that three tech interior pass rush. Um, you know projection that is is good it's useful but i don't see him as being that high-end pass rusher the level of cancy or, or jalen carter that's worth a first round pick so uh definitely a tough spot and and one that i just think the ravens are more likely to try and shore up the position's depth than they are trying to add a starter um especially with how good of a coach anthony weaver is coaching up that defensive line for sure um qb this is this is the fun one um because it's Really, it's not going to happen. Um, you know, I, I don't see the Ravens aren't going to trade up for a QB. Um, the I, I don't think that I don't think Will Levis is going number one Reddit, but I do think that he'll go in the first round well before the Ravens pick, um, as will the other top three quarterbacks, um, Young, Shroud, and, and Anthony Richardson. And that leaves you with, you know, your options of, okay, either Levis or Richardson has fallen spectacularly, in which case I do I run that card up if Richardson somehow there at 22, I don't care what Lamar Jackson thinks of it. Um, If it's Levis, I'm I'm probably staying away because it's, you know, other teams clearly have the same, you know, uh, drawbacks and concerns about him as I do. Other than that, the only option really in the first round is, is Hendon hooker. Um, He posted a video earlier today uh, where it looked like his ACL is healing pretty well. All the reports about his injury recovery have been actually overwhelmingly positive, suggest that he'll be ready to, um, you know, ready to play, ready to ready to be a part of training camp and all that. And really, to me, the only thing, the only logic behind this is it's draft night, the trade with, you know, you're, you're, you're not able to trade for D hop and lock down Lamar. Everyone else you like is off the board. Maybe you've even traded back to the end of the first round and you say, okay, well, I don't know what's happening with my quarterback. I like hooker. I like his skills. He needs to develop in a pro offense instead of Tennessee's offense that was very QB friendly. Um, and you sit him for a year behind Lamar. He's on the older end, but basically you say, I have three years plus his fifth year option. If and you let Lamar go after one season, I don't want to do a Jordan Love thing. And again, I don't even like this scenario, but you let Lamar walk after one season, Hooker takes over in 24, and you just throw everything you have into those three years with him as quarterback. And you say, I have a new rookie quarterback window. I've got that sweet, sweet rookie contract for Hendon Hooker, and I'm throwing everything I have behind a Super Bowl a, a Super Bowl team in these three years. That's the only thing that I could probably talk myself into um, drafting a quarterback in the first round. I, I think one of the scenarios, too, where you were talking about, you know, if, if a guy like Anthony Richardson slides down to 22, I think if you're in that position where you're like, 
do I want to bring this card up? I think your phone's ringing at that point. I think mm-hmm. somebody's going to want to trade, you know, trade up and grab somebody like that because it's it's unthinkable that they would slide to that point. Um, and to your point about Hendon Hooker, you know, this is a guy that immediately after the ACL tear went from being projected as like a top five to 10 pick to being like a third or fourth rounder because we didn't know what his recovery period was going to look like. And so now his projection is creeping back up to kind of where we saw it before. Granted, again, not top five to 10, but somebody that is, you know, garnering first round attention as a guy that, as you said, can redshirt a guy that, you know, has the ability to sit for a year and develop. Um, I like the ceiling of Hooker's ability. I think that this might be a bit of a hot take. I think that his ceiling is the highest only behind Bryce Young in this group of quarterbacks. Um, and I, you know, CJ Stroud, I think is right there with him. Um, again, I, I think that you, unless things within the castle are way worse in terms of the dynamic with Lamar Jackson that we're seeing publicly, then I, I don't think that you, you know, that you, you make that investment. Like you said, it's, it's hard to talk yourself into for sure. Oh yeah. And, and I think, you know, even thinking about the teams that could want to trade up and we can, we can jump into that for one quick minute. Cause I think that's a really good scenario. You brought up a quarterback falls and you're not looking to pick him. You're looking to take advantage of the fact that he's there in a different way. Um, it's, it's not really clear who, who behind the Ravens really would need a quarterback. Like, you know, you understand, okay. It's safe to say that, that the Panthers are going to go the QB. I think if Richardson falls at 12, the Texans will probably just take him at 12. Um, So suppose, just suppose the Texans get a QB as well. The Colts seem dead set on getting a QB at four. That one would blow me away if they didn't take a quarterback at four. Um, But, you know, after that, teams like the Seahawks, the Lions, the the Raiders, the Falcons, they all have quarterbacks that they're willing to play, at least right now. The Falcons are probably the team that I would want to trade up from 44, their second round pick the most. Um, But in all of those scenarios, all of those teams are teams with or with second round picks. They don't have a late first rounder. And so you're going to have to be willing to trade out of the second round, which quite frankly, at, at where, where the draft is right now. And, and if this scenario plays out, if I can get a King's ransom, if I can get a second, a third, a future third, something like that to really, you know, I'd love to add picks next year as well. Not just this year. Um, if I can get a King's ransom for that quarterback at 22, I, I'm, I'm taking that and I'll, I'll, I'll wait until I'll wait until I'm on the clock. If I have to wait an entire day. I would love if, so if it was the Falcons calling and they're saying, oh, we're going to give you 44 and um, like you said, that future pick, but at that point, you know, if you're, if you need to get creative with what you're doing with your assets within the draft, maybe, you know, ask them for a young position player, a guy like Arnold Ebicady, um, you know, and I, I don't know that they do that, but if they say like, this is the quarterback we're sold on, I mean, the worst thing you can do is ask and then have them say no. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's another, another really good thought is, you know, when, when these teams are calling, you know, teams hate giving up their draft picks. So what can you do to kind of grab a player that you might, you might value more than they do and, and kind of get yourself another steal that way while also trading back. Um, yeah. I could see the Falcons. I could see the Raiders. Um, you know, I, I, I could see the Lions doing it. The Lions will trade in and out of anywhere. It seems like, um, and the, the Seahawks as well have, have just a ton of draft capital. And so if they're saying, look, we, you know, seems like they really want to take Jalen Carter at five. Um, they have the 20th overall. So that, that would probably be, you know, where they'd take that quarterback who falls and Detroit also has 18. Um, but again, who knows? You're probably looking at, you know, we're probably end up ending up going to look at the Raiders, the Falcons, um, you know, the Vikings are right behind us. They may want to trade up one spot to lock down a guy who could succeed Kirk Cousins. So I think there are a lot of interesting opportunities there. If, if a quarterback does fall, um, moving on to our last category uh, that we had for these rankings is, is wild card. And, and this one, I just, I, I liked because as much as you can count on the Ravens to go with a first round cornerback, you also can't count on the Ravens to not go with a first round. Uh, I don't know, linebacker because they just, they, they love the position, especially if they trade back to the end of the first and they feel like they can get the best linebacker in this class. Cause it doesn't look like any of them are going to go before bef- in the first round anyway. Um, that's definitely something that's gotta be, gotta be thinking it gotta be on their mind. So in a wild card, and we're talking linebacker running back safety um, and tight end here. What are you looking for, for in that player? I, boy, I hope we don't go tight end because uh, Ravens Twitter would absolutely combust. Um, I think if this one's kind of cheating a little bit, if you're looking at maybe safety, a guy like Brian Branch, because he's listed in a safety, but like, I think if you really look at the way that he's, he's playing, like he could just be listed as defensive back. He can play anywhere. 
I think, again, the optics of it wouldn't be great for those who are uninitiated to Brian Branch's game. If they went with two first round safeties in a row, Ravens fans everywhere would be livid, um, obviously, until they saw him on the field. Mm -hmm. Um, This one, and I, you know, I kind of alluded to this when we were writing about it. This one will probably get me flamed a little bit. Like, if if B. John Robinson is there, again, if the situation with J.K. Dobbins is untenable, where, you know, he's expressed some frustration about the way that he's been used, if you know behind closed doors that he wants out, that he doesn't want to be there in the system if he's not going to be a guy that's getting 15, 20 carries, you know, in a, in a high profile performance. I mean, you know, is, is it worth it? Is it worth trying to, you know, take, because Bijan is, and I I feel confident saying this, the best running back prospect that I've seen since a guy like Saquon Barkley, like he's incredible. Everything about his athleticism, his performance, all the way that he's measured, he's going to revamp whatever offense he joins completely. Um, I I mean, it's, I I will be excited to have an athlete like that at 22, but also like, I would be livid with the other needs that we had if we went running back in the first round. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's so hard. And and there's a lot of statistical evidence to say that drafting running back early is, is not a good idea. And even, but even those people who carry that torch, um, you know, PFF pro football focus is, you know, probably the the biggest running back haters out there. And I mean that in a good way, because I, I agree with that. I agree with them. I agree with the math on it. Even they have Robinson as a first round grade along with everyone else. And, and, and because he's that kind of guy that you can build an offense around, you can throw him in the slot, you can call a lot of screens, just get the ball in his hands. And that's something that Todd Munkin has proven to be really good at doing is getting the ball in his playmaker's hands. Uh, and so, you know, if it's going to be Roman and you're just handing the ball off to be John Robinson 20 times a game, I'm not sure I'm like, I'm not sure that's the best use of, of resources, but if you're really, if you're picking him to design a dynamic offense and, and, Uh, I think he said something on, on, I think he was on the Pat McAfee show earlier. He said something about, um, you know, not being just a running back and, and, you know, teams looking at him as more than a running back, a guy who plays in the slot and does a lot of different things. You know, again, I feel the same way with you, or I'm just like, I just don't see the value in it, but you got to have, you know, if they had a plan with Kyle Hamilton last year to bring him along and, you know, they had it from the start, if they have that with Bijan, I'm willing to let it play out provided that we're able to flip Dobbins for something of value, but having all three of them on the roster plus justice Hill would seem like overkill and also make it clear that you're not signing Dobbins, which is fine. I'm not really a big fan of paying running backs, big second contracts either. Um, But man, that one, that would be controversial. I I think I could, I could live with it. I couldn't live with Bijan going to the Eagles at 10 or the Falcons at eight. That would hurt my brain a little too much. Um, but the Ravens saying, look, this guy is a top five pure talent in this class. And, you know, he's he's a first round player. You have a first round grade on him. That's absolutely true. He's a first round player. You know what you're getting. My trouble is you just don't see those guys on the best teams, you know, in the NFL. You know, your Dalvin Cooks, your Christian McCaffrey's, you know, McCaffrey now he is because he's been used, he's being used perfectly. But it's just tough when you when you use a first round pick on on an asset that just doesn't feel like it's the most valuable. Yeah. Um, I'm far more with you on Brian Branch. In fact, I think of the realistic guys who will be there, he's probably my second favorite behind Deontay Banks, even over Flowers and Addison. Um, I love his game. I think that you can do all sorts of interesting things with matchups, with slot receivers and tight ends, with him and Hamilton. He doesn't profile. He didn't play a lot of deep safety. I think he can. Um, I, I think that he has the range and the football IQ to do. I mean, his, his tape is like watching a guy, you know, be peeking into the other team's huddle before the play. He's really instinctive and really good at diagnose, diagnosing route concepts in front of him. And I think that that is really an underrated trait of a guy coming out of college is that is that level of football IQ and attention to detail. Cause it's not something that even Kyle Hamilton had coming out of college. Um, he was much, I wouldn't say raw. I just don't think he was quite at, he was more of a read and react and relied on his athleticism a lot. Branch is athletic, but he really relies on his ability to just diagnose and process very quickly. And having a guy like that in a complicated defense, you know, you could slot him in, in multiple roles in the slot, in the box, deep safety right away. And, and trust that he's going to take all of that on and excel in multiple roles, even as a rookie. Um, it's it's just so tough making that pick, that safety designation. But when you think about him as a slot corner, when you think about the importance of having five to six defensive backs on the field at a time in the NFL, it, the concern to me really kind of dissipates. 
So I think the last thing that kind of interests me, you know, we talked about some of these kind of bigger trade backs that might net the Ravens a couple day two, day three picks, um, or sorry, multiple day two picks and kind of beef up some of the, 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 just the pure quantity of draft picks that they have. But if the Ravens would trade back kind of to the end of the first round, if you're thinking about the players that are expected to kind of go to the end of the first round, or maybe a guy that is going to slip to the second round that you'd really love to grab at the end of the first round, um, but you don't quite love it. 22. You got, you got any players in mind for that? Man, I don't know. I, I think if I, it's going to honestly depend on how much they love a guy like Emmanuel Forbes and they mm-hmm. think that he could become like, cause I've seen a cop to Trayvon Diggs with him. And there is some of that, like kind of home run hitter, like either he's, he's really on or he's really not. Um, and if they think that they can get him really on all the time, his ability to flip the field is incredible. I think he had six pick sixes in his college career. And so, you know, if you're looking for a guy that's more about ball skills for a guy that's going to be a defensive impact player and you really love Emmanuel Forbes, but you don't love him at 22, um, you know, maybe you look at at the possibility of a trade back. Um, One of the ones that I know that I kept trying in box and it was limited success was with the Eagles. They had 30 and I think 62 and so looking at those considerations, like if they offer that to you because they really love a guy that slid, I mean, maybe, you know, you look at that, but um, yeah, I would, I would say Emmanuel Forbes is probably on my short list of players that like, if I was really wanting to snag a guy like right at the end of the, the first round or at the beginning of the second, he's probably one that I would take a look at. Yeah. I really like Forbes. I think that's a, I think that's a good call. He's, he's been mocked to the Ravens plenty of times, even as early as 22. And it feels like um, the Ravens are, it feels like the Ravens might be a bit higher on him than other teams. And I think that that kind of feeds into this, you know, well, okay, well, we, we know he's going to be there potentially. We, we think he might be there into the forties, but rather than try and trade up for 86, let's trade back to the end of the first round. You're able to get that second round pay, or you're able to get that fifth year option with him as well. Um, which it, like I said earlier, it's becoming less and less of a valuable asset, especially at these high paid positions where, and, and a player makes a pro bowl as, as, uh, on their rookie deal, but I could see that as an option. I think Keely Ringo out of Georgia is another guy where you're like, I want five years with this guy. He's mm-hmm. got so much skill or so much athleticism, so much physicality, just needs a lot of, um, you know, just technique and, and tape study just, just needs to beef up becoming an NFL cornerback in the, in, in the non-athletic physical ways. Um, you know, that's another guy that you're saying, okay, that fifth year option could feel like a steal in a few years, especially if he takes a little while to get going and he doesn't have a pro bowl under his belt by the time it's time to exercise that option. Um, you know, that then you're like, okay, I catch him right at a good time to exercise that option and and, and have him vault into a career year or something like that. Um, but, but I agree with you. It, there, there aren't really a lot of guys that I'd target, I'd trade down and, and target so much as I would trade down and, and hope to see a Brian Bercy at 30 or a, um, an Osiris Torrance at 30. Some of the guys that we've already mentioned um, where you just may have, whether it's their positional value or your, or your lack of need for them specifically, but you really like the talent wait until the end of the first round, see if you can snag them there. I think that would be a solid strategy because when you do that, you're picking up another, you know, fourth, fifth round or something like that in the process. Yeah, for sure. And I I think with some of the needs that we've talked about, so like defensive tackle, obviously they're down Calais Campbell, who's not returning this year on interior offensive line. If you can pick up a mid round pick there, I mean, there are players that can be impact players that are projected to go in that range. Um, Chandler Zavala obviously is a guy that like, every team seems to love, but he seems to be projected right around that like 100 range. And so, I mean, I don't know that he lasts that long, but if you do see a guy like that and you love him, when you pick up those mid rounders, you can always take a swing at one of those positions. Um, I think defensive tackle, especially is one where, you know, there's not immediate pressure right away for that player to be an impact just because of the players that the Ravens have in house. But if you want to beef it up and you want to make sure that you're not down a position on the depth chart after Calais Campbell's departure, you have guys that, that are going to be there that I think you can take the time to develop. Um, Moro Ojomo out of uh, Texas, um, Jacqueline Roy out of LSU, you mm-hmm. know, size that's there that you're missing because Calais is in the middle of that defensive line. And, you know, if they, if they end up just being a guy at that point, if you've picked up an extra pick, it's not a huge deal. As long as they don't bust like that, I think is, is where the value is in those picks. 
Yeah. And, you know, DaCosta said, you know, the craft, the, the draft is a crapshoot, you know, we're not going to hit on every pick, you know, and, and if you're, if you're hitting on half of your picks every year, that's, that's fantastic. And one of the ways they like to kind of help that hit rate is by getting more picks, right. Yeah. More bites at the apple, more chance that you're going to strike gold. Um, and, and I think that that's not, not a bad mentality, especially when you look at the way this draft class is set up and it's like, okay, you know, there are guys who fall to you that you run the card up banks. You take that pretty comfortably. Branch, you're looking for a trade back maybe, but you take that pretty comfortably. Same thing with Flowers and Addison. After that, you're really hunting for a trade back. And, and you know, you might, and, you know, like we've talked about, you might have to be willing to trade all the way back into the second round with, you know, say a Miami team or something like that that doesn't have a first rounder. And in which case, you know, those top tier prospects are all going to, all going to whiz by you and you're going to have to really make your money on day two um which is not something i'm afraid of with this draft class with how deep the cornerbacks are with where the wide receiver talent is um i think day two could be a really fertile day if they trade out of the first entirely so i think there's a chance that we don't see them use pick 22 or even a first rounder at all tomorrow night or i guess what will be tonight when you're listening to this yeah and and i think what i'm hoping if i see that notification come across is that it's the cardinals that come on the board because with some of the whispers that we've been hearing, you know, I, I think as soon as you see that immediately, the hope in your heart is a piece of this deal is Deandre Hopkins comes, comes across and they have, you know, they have pick 34. So it's not like you're having to wait that far into day two. If that is, you know, a pick swap. Um, yeah. yeah I, I love the Cardinals as a trade back partner without Hopkins. They have 34, 66, 96, 106, 158. I think there's another one in there maybe, but like I've, I've run, I've kind of run the numbers on all the different trade backs and you know, the, the, I, I'm glad you bring that up. I think trading 22 for 34 and Hopkins is a, just a really good starting point and, and just presenting it to the Cardinals and saying, look, you're not getting a second round pick for Hopkins. It's not happening. Um, you're not, you're not even going to get a second round pick value for him in a pick stop. But what we will do is we'll give you a first round and that looks really good. You can take that to the bank. You got your fifth year option. You're getting another top 20 player. Um, if they're not able to trade back from three and, and pick up more picks in the first and second round, then they're probably excited to get another first rounder. Um, and there are other ways to kind of combine and mix and match our picks and theirs to kind of make up the surplus value of DeAndre Hopkins to where we want it to be. And obviously the rest of that, depending on salary concerns and how much salary the cards are willing to eat of his this year, um, which seems to me like it's the remaining sticking point is nailing down that exact detail. If, if anything, I think if, if the Ravens are close to deals, that's reported. I think what they're trying to nail down is exactly how much cap the Cardinals are willing to take on of, of Hopkins deal and how much that's worth in trade value to both teams. So um, I, I agree that I think Hopkins and the, and, and a Hopkins plus 34 trade back from 22 is probably the ideal scenario for Baltimore on draft night. Yeah. And I, I have to say how impressed I am. This is a man who's run quite a few mocks as you can tell, <laughs> because he's rattling off the picks of Arizona. I can tell that you've targeted that a couple of different times. Yeah. I mean, I just, you know, again, the idea of grabbing, you know, a Forbes at 34, right. Just sounds or Ringo even potentially at 34 just sounds so appealing because um, you know, the drop off from, you know, Porter and banks that tier two to, to Ringo and, and Forbes is, is real. And you don't want to be taken. And, and ideally you, there's, there's somewhat of a gap between when banks and, and Porter go, if they're going late teens, early twenties, before you can get to them, you know, going Forbes right after them kind of feels like, man, you're, you're reaching, you're reaching into the next tier for a guy. And so I just think it's an ideal spot. I I'm sure the Ravens have identified that too. I'm sure they're, they're feeling the same way I am about, you know, trading back and getting Hopkins kind of kills two birds with one stone. Um, plus the third stone of or the third bird that could be killed is Lamar Jackson. Um, and and not literally, of course, with just lock him down with his contract. I mean, but but that's kind of the third domino that could fall as a result of this trade and might be the thing that would make it the most compelling and most exciting as you finally get that done. Kevin, thanks so much for joining me. This was a blast. I'm excited to break down the draft with you after it happens uh, and stay tuned for more content. Thanks for yeah, listening, man. everyone. Awesome being here. Thanks.